How's it going everyone? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This is even more gas drag. They just keep on coming and they don't stop coming. I really want to finish these before the end of the year, so I'm really trying to push forward here quite aggressively. This video is, I guess, brought to you by my own content. A lot of people think this is a Deltarune only channel, and some just think maybe it's gaming in general. I try to cover a lot of topics. I view it as a variety channel. Maybe check out one of my game reviews, a video essay on a movie, or a review of a TV show. I have a big video cooking that's going to come out in a couple days. Or check out Graham Games. I upload Let's Plays over there. If you like this content, there's probably something else for you, either on this channel or that one. You probably have some time to kill over the holidays. Go take a look around. I promise you'll find something else you like. Now on to some of them savory, yoky gags. Apparently the whole idea of having moss in your cell is a reference to the 1993 Super Nintendo game Illusion of Gaia, in which you get thrown into a very similar looking cell, although most cells kind of look the same, and you have to interact with the moss specifically before your friend Lily breaks you out. This moss has seen thousands of prisoners come and go. Those prisoners must have been encouraged by any sign of life. When visiting Rudy in Chapter 1, after the cutscene with Noelle, we can first interact with the sink. Oh, so you're just here to use the sink, huh? Come on, Chris, be a little friendlier. Now in Chapter 2, if you interact with the sink before Rudy... Hey, Chris, why are you checking the sink? That's what I'm asking, sweetheart. And instead, if you had interacted with the sink before Rudy in Chapter 1 and again in Chapter 2. Damn it all, Chris. You really love that sink, huh? That sink too, Rudy Zero. Don't worry. I'm gonna pull it back. You wait. If you had interacted with the sink without these other interactions, Rudy asks if we're practicing for tonight's hand-washing marathon. Showing that maybe this is some behavior that Chris has been exhibiting for a while. Maybe Rudy would come over to see Toriel and Asgore, and Chris would disappear for long stretches of time, running the sink just like we had seen at the end of Chapter 2. There are a few other small interactions that seem to feed into this. If you try to use the sink before school, it's not yet time to wash your hands. And then in the final scene of the game, getting ready to bake a pie with Toriel and Susie, we're being steered away from the kitchen sink, towards this privacy. Toriel asks Susie to wash her hands, whereas Chris insists on it. Oh, you need to wash your hands too? But Chris also will not use the kitchen sink. It's a sink, you could wash your hands here, but isn't the sink in the bathroom better? If you interact with anything in the bathroom other than the sink, no need for it. And if you say no, then the tap will be waiting until you choose to run it. Some external force seems to be guiding our actions towards the bathroom so we can run the tap as loud as possible. Subtle influences, rather than specifically demanding what happens. We have some very revealing interactions with the hospital piano starting back in chapter one. Oh, it's you. Are you here to play the piano again? The patients can't hear it well from here, but I personally enjoy it. It's an obligatory hospital piano shrunk to fit in the corner. As a result, it's missing most of the good keys. And when playing the piano, plink. Hmm, you usually play the piano a bit more beautifully? Is everything okay? You do seem a little sick. If at the end of chapter two with Susie with us, whoa, Chris, you can play the piano? Blink. <laughs> Almost thought you were serious for a sec. What's with that pissed off look? Indicating that Chris is trying, that they know they normally can play the piano. The implication between the VHS resulting from the video game piano tutorial, as well as the two pixelated tutorials from also searching video game piano tutorial, some have interpreted this as being a reference to the piano puzzle in Undertale, suggesting that maybe Chris was playing this game within a game, and that Undertale is a game within this world and they're looking up how to solve it. But I think more what's happening here is that since Chris is not in control 
of their own body. They've seemingly forgotten how to play the piano, and maybe as the controller of this character trying to blend in, we're attempting to relearn the tutorial ourselves through this video game we're playing. We, or whoever is in charge of Chris's body. When backtracking our way through the game, if we go and hit up the hacker in his original location. I just wanted to make a cool demo scene for you. Now that I finished this, I can show up all sorts of places. Demo scenes aren't really a thing anymore. There used to be these demo parties or competitions where groups would throw together intros or demo scenes. As it was described to me in the comments, they used to be a kind of show-off to other crack groups when starting up a cracked game. They were ways of showing off programming, visual art, and musical skills. They first emerged around the 1980s, when we first started having home computers, and the subsequent advent of software cracking. They would then remove the first party introductions to the game showing off who made it and instead putting in their own crack tros, which is a, a name that just does not roll off the tongue, and they would compete amongst each other for the best visual presentation of these additions often only being a few megabytes at the absolute most. It's crazy what they were capable of doing, because these intros would only be about four megabytes. It's a side of things I never really knew about. It's a topic I kind of want to look into further, so thank you, LightSpark. When the Queen captures everyone and is uncertain what to do with Ralsei, we get this sort of cartoony, comedic beat of the screen zooming in on the Queen's face before all fading to black. It's a pretty common trope, but it seems like the specific way this one was done, including the sound effects, was meant to be taken straight from Super Mario World. When we have the queen's face on screen, the background is a green hill and fluffy cloudy sky. This is likely a reference to Bliss, the default computer wallpaper for computers running Microsoft's Windows XP operating system. I find that all the more believable considering all the tech in this world is being pulled from the library that has outdated computers. Bliss is a funny one because considering the number of people who had Microsoft computers at the time, it's been suggested that Bliss is the most seen image of all time. The Queen informs us that everything we see in our rooms are catered to us, gleaned from our internet search histories, which would explain why everyone has a room in the cyber world, including characters like Jockington and Caddy, despite them never seemingly been brought here themselves. The Queen's mansion is more like this data warehouse. We all know that companies like Facebook and Google data mine as much from us as possible, building up these personality profiles based on our search histories and interests. And so seemingly, the Queen is putting together these profiles in the form of rooms to house people in the eventuality that they arrive in this cyber world. Interestingly, when inspecting these different rooms, we have things like Birdly and Jockington, but we specifically have Caddy with a Y, not Caddy with an I. Most of the other ones we see are Chris's classmates or of a similar age. Now, alongside our literal brother Asriel, we have Caddy with a Y, someone who would instead have been Asriel's age. So either their information has been cataloged the same as everyone else, or there's a theory out there that at some point Asriel and Caddy went on their own Dark World adventure. And considering the much larger theories that I'm not going to get into right now, where I have previously thought that Noelle's sister is unfortunately dead, many have suggested maybe she's simply missing. And that could be a story beat of a future chapter that Des has been lost in a dark world all this time. Now, normally you check your inventory and allow Lancer to help you out of this cage if we attempt to use our phone. We have the usual garbage noise, but Susie chimes in. Hey, Chris, do you hear something? Sounds like it's coming from your pocket? Your phone going off or something? If you do it again, hey, Chris, does your phone usually, uh, yell? And with the delay, hey, Chris, pick up your damn phone. 
Isn't it with your keys or whatever? We start hearing little noises, supposedly from Lancer trying to get our attention. It was relatively recently confirmed by Toby that the handsome Lancer face is a reference to the webcomic Paranatural, written by Zach Morrison. Apparently, Toby's a big fan of it. This face from chapter 5, page 22, seems to maybe be the best candidate for this reference, especially considering the mention of hopes and dreams, with one of the songs in chapter 1 of Deltarune being Field of Hopes and Dreams. When Lancer's bailing us out of the cell, he specifically overloads the computer with shovel requests. This is known as a dozens and dozens of shovels attack, which is meant to be a play on a DDoS attack. DDoS, dozens and dozens of shovels. This is a form of spam attack on someone's internal provider that overloads the server, shutting down your connection to the internet. There is an added layer to this joke that you are particularly likely to get exposed to this sort of virus or attack through shovelware. Seems like the room is overflowing with shovels. And you don't have anything to dig through them with. After the Queen wins this little carnival game and Noelle hands over a gift, Queen just hands this over to Chris and it's up to us to decide who receives the gift. I can't believe I haven't actually covered this branching option yet. When the full game's available, I'm gonna need a better system. It's so easy to overlook little moments like this. Oh, Chris, what's that you have there? Is that a gift for someone? Give it to Noel. Chris, you have something for me? Chris hasn't given me a gift like this since we were little kids. Are they saying they want things to go back? Wait, isn't that the plush I just gave Queen? What, you want a refund so you can... Come on, say that to my face, gosh! N Noelle? Give it to Ralsei. Huh? You're giving it to me? Chris, I I've never gotten a gift like this before. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I... I'm so happy, I don't really know what to say. I I'll win something for you too, okay? One baseball, please. Wait a second! Noel, Give it to Susie. H huh? What? Alright, where the hell did you get this? Perhaps they won it at the orb tossing game. Yeah, like Chris could ever win that. They must have stole it or something. <laughs> stole it? Wow, they must have really wanted to give it to you. Well, takes guts to do something stupid like that. Don't think I'm gonna let you outdo me. If you're gonna pull some stupid stunt like that, then I'll steal you something too. Cool box. Ah, uh, ah, uh, Noel, give it to Birdly. Chris, have you seen? <gasps> Chris, we took a break from trucing for one second, and you're already back with Susie. Should have expected this. Hmm. You couldn't keep up with my puzzle-solving skills. Huh? A plushie? Of me? With nipples? Hmm, I guess I'll forgive you now. See you, Chris. Why the hell did you give it to Birdly? Why did you give it to Birdly? Um, what unexpected kindness, Chris. Let's just get the hell out of here. Wait! Noel, Taking everyone to the boxes with amazing craftsmanship. Hell yeah, boxes! This is what it's about! Chris, you were living it up without us, huh? And went asking Noelle about her cool cardboard box face. If after the whole team is back together, we go and interact with the stall that Noelle was hiding behind. Hey Noelle, one thing we gotta get straight. Y y yes Where the hell did you put that cool box? Um, I just sort of, I, I, whatever, just make us another one. Uh, okay, sure. Now, considering that we know Susie doesn't have a great home life, the fact that Susie specifically admires these boxes, I don't want to go so far as to say that Susie lives in a box, but maybe it's just that she's never really had toys growing up and instead has always had to make do with her imagination playing around in cardboard boxes, building up her own specific appreciation for them. And again, you can become lost in the craftsmanship. 
Obviously, these pictures of Queen are modeled after Mona Lisa, you know, with the addition of fire-breathing capabilities. But my favorite detail with these is that there's a little laughing segment of the song, at which point all of the pictures stop spouting fire and actually laugh along with it for a moment. They're also seemingly playing that game where they make you look at a circle below your waist. The queen's trolling us pretty hard there. You can talk to the different swatchlings while balancing this pottery through this room. They'll all say the same thing. Please do not race the pottery, except for the very last swatchling, although they only seem to have an alternate bit of dialogue if you talked to other swatchlings in the room first. Yes, we see you. You are the master of balance. Looking specifically at the task manager's design, color scheme, outfit, and even the whip they use, it's all very similar to the Ace Attorney character, Franziska von Karma. There's a lot going on with this character. I'll start with a quick gag when using Susie and Ralsei's R and S actions on the task manager. Susie barked madly. Ralsei listened closely. Alongside the barking, Susie has this little beware of Susie sign. You know, she's acting like a dog to try and scare the cats. And if you have the Jevil's Tail equipped, Task Manager will specifically comment on it. Chaos, chaos? No. Order, order. Now get rid of that silly tail. And there's very similar dialogue for equipping the Devil's Knife, simply ending with, now get rid of that Devil's Knife. Task Manager, obsessed with order and abhors chaos. Whip it good, which itself is a reference to an old Devo song, simply titled Whip It, with Whip It Good being one of the lyrics. But the game specifically capitalizes chaos and not order. This is some potentially elemental, primordial force in this world. And Task Manager seems to specifically be aware of Jevil and stands in opposition to them. Shouting things like, order, order, is kind of a common, maybe tropey phrase for a character that seemingly also has these connections to a courtroom with the whole Ace Attorney reference going on. And the Task Manager is obviously a play on a Task Manager, a computer function you used for organizing and ordering the tasks you have open, the way it all ties into Jevil is very interesting. If we attempt to order the task manager, you ask task manager to show you order. She obliges. And once things are sufficiently organized, they can be spared. I've just found it so interesting that while the character of Jevil is entirely separate from everything else we see in Chapter 1, with a few comments from Sham seemingly being the only thing we really have to go off of, we now suddenly have characters like Spampton and Task Manager that are specifically aware of them. They weren't always the hidden away recluse that we see now. Chainmail is just a brilliant gag, you know, like the medieval armor of having a mail of chain, but it's obviously also meant to reference the old spammy messages that were sent around back in the day. Send it to 10 others or it'll lose its defensive rating. The queen statues all around this room are all meant to look like the famous marble statue, the thinker. An extra little gag, once you've found the secret in this room and speak to the hacker, I'm retiring from hacking the mainframe. I decided to use my powers for the good of society. I'm going to reverse engineer the code for Super Smashing Fighters, so I can put my favorite cartoon characters into the game. Just once again tying in the recurring idea of Super Smashing Fighters, our parody game of Super Smash Bros. Something Toby's obviously a big fan of as well as connecting to fan mods of platform fighters like Project M, designed to add additional characters to those games. Looking at the egg in Susie's room, it's a painted egg. It's warm. From search query, can Har boil eggs hatch? After her conversation with Tem, Susie went and specifically looked up, can they hatch? Back in chapter one, when you have to pick a partner for your project, when you talk to Tem, crisp. Oh, very sores. Tem already have partner. At which point they pull out this egg. It's a black and white hard-boiled egg. 
Sadly, seems like it already has a partner. I was wondering if she looked up this information and then brought it to Tem, but I think Susie would have went and looked this up specifically after talking to Tem. Tem partner with Egg. Sue's very mean, said Egg, never hatch. Imitating the way Tem would say it, hard-boil eggs rather than hard-boiled, Temmy was seemingly so insistent that Susie started to doubt how eggs work and went looking it up. The hard-boiled egg emanates a feeling of pity towards you. Bear with me, this is going to take a minute to get where I want to go, but I'm about to go deep on something highly specific in these two chapters. It hasn't really mattered yet, but it's going to be huge when the full game releases. Seemingly light works as an inverse in the dark world. We instead have dark bulbs instead of light bulbs that cast bright shadows on the ground, and then we fill up the space with the dark. It's just kind of fun conceptually to have things work as an inverse that way, but it also adds a lot more significance to the shadow crystal. We're seeing that here in the dark world, a shadow is something of significance, potentially a positive thing the way we would think of a bright light. Symbolically, we think of darkness and shadows as being bad things. These are good to the darkness. So while we can assume this cryptic shadow crystal will play an important role in future chapters, it may actually lead to something good. I mean, that's one interpretation. The two shadow crystals we get come from defeating Jevil and Spampton, two characters who have seemingly gone completely mad. So, you know, maybe they're not the best thing. There are different interactions with the shadow crystal, using them in the dark or light world, whether you have one of them or two, with just the one from the devil, a sharp shadow moves like water in the hand. You held the crystal up to your eye. For some strange reason, for just a brief moment, you thought you saw toys strewn on the floor, but it must have just been your imagination. So maybe Jevil either realized he was in a game, or just that he's some darkness-fueled inanimate object. We can then inspect it again in the overworld. You looked through the glass. For some strange reason, for just a brief moment, you thought you saw through your hand. When inspecting the shadow crystal, there is a small shard of something in your pocket. It feels like glass, but... And if you attempt to drop it, you didn't quite understand why, but the thought of discarding it felt very wrong. When you have that first chapter shadow crystal and use it in the castle town, you held the crystal up to your eye, but nothing happened. And when you have a second one to use in chapter two, you held the crystal up to your eye. For some strange reason, for just a brief moment, you thought you saw the computer lab. But it must have just been your imagination. And if used again, it doesn't seem very useful. And using that one in the overworld, you looked through the glass. For some strange reason, for just a moment, you thought you saw Susie glaring at you, coldly. But when you moved the glass away, you see her looking at you smiling and making a rude gesture. And again, for some reason, you're unable to drop this item. Interacting with Shom on a fresh save or simply one where you had never fought and defeated Jevil, he'll simply talk about moving to a new world and hints that maybe you should come see him if you ever encounter a super special secret treasure. Instead, visiting him on a save file where you had previously defeated Jevil. Here we are in a new world. And right off the heels of defeating that clown. Incredible. Oh? What's that? It seems like he gave something to you. That's right. You must not have noticed it. That crystal. It's nearly invisible. But you've been holding it this whole time. Here. I'll take it off your hands and appraise it. Incredible. To think he had a shadow crystal. Shadow crystals, so called because you can only see their shadow. Call it a premonition, but I get the feeling you may find more of these. If you continue to defeat strong adversaries like him, that is. If you can gather more shadow crystals, bring them here. Anyone who's seen my Gaster videos will know the significance of highlighting him. I'm sure I can stitch together something incredible for you. 
if you have only the first shadow crystal and complete the second chapter, it seems that you didn't get another shadow crystal. Hmm, I understand. It's no small feat to fight an opponent that has one. Well then, forget it all. You're a lightner. Don't take your life, well, lightly. He seemingly wants you to abandon it altogether if you weren't able to obtain this second one. When we try to use this thing on our own, we're told it's not very useful, yet we have Sham over here implying that shadow crystals are something we're only going to encounter with incredibly powerful beings. If you did not obtain the Jevil Shadow Crystal, but you do have the Spamped Neo one, what is that? It appears you have a Shadow Crystal. Unfortunately, I believe that you were missing one from your previous adventures. But are you sure? Are you sure you didn't defeat that clown? Perhaps you just haven't remembered that you had yet. That's right, as long as you ever defeated that enemy in the past, then perhaps even now, that crystal might turn up somewhere close. Shom and this dark world as a whole seemingly have an awareness of these alternate realities and universes which spawn from our different save files. If you ever defeated Jevil, even if it wasn't through this specific save, you can go to this cliffside and retrieve the missing shadow crystal and any of the Jevil's items you would have earned. And finally talking to Shom with both shadow crystals. Aha! Another shadow crystal! You found it. You can't see it, so perhaps you didn't notice. Didn't you defeat him? Didn't you defeat Jevil? Here, I'll take that crystal. Now you have collected two of them. Huzzah! You have collected two shadow crystals. But don't let down your guard. I feel your next opponent may be... Hmm. In reality, it may be impossible to win unless you use the power of the Shadow Mantle. Here, it may look like an old scrap of cloth, but... Eh? I can't find it. Did someone take it? <laughs> well now, there goes your one chance of victory, giving us a tease of something we'll have to keep an eye out in a future chapter. There are different points in the game where you can do some major backtracking. I pitched in an earlier video maybe showing the dialogue that changes when doing so, and people encouraged me to include that in a future video. So I'll show some of that here now, and save the rest of it for the inevitable 8th video. Yes, there is going to be a number 8, that should be the last one. And I mean, really, it's the ninth if you include the Spamped in Eggs video. That one seemed to go kind of unnoticed. Maybe I shouldn't have titled it differently, but I was, I was kind of doing a thing with that. So yeah, if you missed that video, check that one out too. Doing a quick backtrack first after facing off with the three musical robots, the way to the city is now open. I think I'll stay in the countryside a bit longer though. Everything is so naturally green here. I'm charmed by the local music and flavors. Looks like this gamer's paradise has become a gamer's hell. I don't know if that's supposed to be like a, a gangster's paradise thing, probably not. Recently, something called internet is having an outage. Some say it was the secret to Queen's know-how. Since then, it seems like she's become quite extreme. I'm really only interested in cute digital cats. I don't think the internet has anything to do with that. All my friends turned into werewires, but it's no big deal. I've been on Queen's side since the beginning, so I'm safe. Complain about Queen, but she gets a lot done. And just a few short screens later, we actually have a werewire wearing that very same hat. And he does appear to be gone. It seems like he was actually captured in the end. There's not a lot to see backtracking there, it's pretty early in the game, but if you do so again after first reaching the Queen's Mansion and breaking free, I'll work my way forward and show off dialogue that's changed in this time. There is now a lone pot from inside the Queen's Mansion, and when you trigger it, we get chased down by a pop-up. Previously, you were filled with the power of this cat sign in front of the save point. Here, you're mostly filled with the power of fluffy boys and mean girls. The cat sign still comprises about 1% of it. The first time around, we are filled with the power of not knowing what a sugar plum is. And when coming back, Noel is no longer in your party. All of you are filled with the power of not knowing what a sugar plum is. Inspecting the pylons. Hey Chris, 
Ever think about using these cones? Y using them? For ice cream. We are basically supposed to be part of Queen's army, but until she takes over the world, we still have to work. Living as a salary man. Maybe I was assimilated before I got controlled. Ooh, deep, very political. Pretty much everyone else is a werewire now. Kind of wondering if I'm holding everything back. I'm not even sure I would make a good werewire. Speaking specifically with the Addison who would normally offer to give us the marriage shoes with Noel. Ah, you three look together. How about some marriage shoes? It's not very often in games we see someone assuming a set of three characters are a thruple. I'm sure that's some fan's ultimate fantasy. Someone in the comments said they suspect that this existential dread character Icon Man is a visual and personality reference to a snake-like character seen in Princess Remedy in a Heap of Trouble. That's a game and series that I'm not really familiar with and I couldn't really find information on. I don't want to rule out that it may or may not be a reference, but I'm definitely going to need help with that one. In the area that once had the Golden Birdly statue, Queen told us to take out the garbage. I'd never seen a garbage that big before, except for the dancing garbage that lives in the trash heap. So I, I'm guessing he's talking about trashy, he was just always dancing around, he's a literal big garbage. It was a horrible statue, but the execution was very good. I would give it two stars. One to cover each of the nipples. It's in a better place now. And as we know, it's just kind of shoved down into a toilet. Our musical friends are gone. We no longer even have music in this area of the game. It's totally silent. I came to support the rebels, but they aren't here. Not really sure how I would support them, though. I don't really want to eat bagels. You are filled with the power of silence. And the tea guy actually will still sell you tea. This is how you're able to get flavors of Susie and Ralsei as well. But if you don't choose a flavor, who will? If you took the shortcut back to an earlier part of the game and walked your way all the way through these traffic sections, we then have this enormous toilet blocking our path? For some strange reason, a giant toilet-shaped toilet is blocking the way. Back when Toby was giving early teases of this chapter, he actually included this image, I think trying to throw people off, sharing something from the game but not anything significant and something kind of utterly disconnected from the rest of what's going on. You actually can't pass it whatsoever. I think it's just meant to generally make fun of the idea of having arbitrary obstacles in the way of your characters so they can't progress to areas when the developer doesn't want them to. Rather than putting up a simple barricade, Toby chooses to mess around with this trope by having Undyne doing bench presses with a car or just throwing a giant toilet in front of us. And that's everything I've got for now. We're in that home stretch. Take a look around the channel. Keep an eye out. I have a few more major videos coming before the end of the year, and I'm pretty proud of them, especially the one I have coming midweek. Totally different for me, but I'm really excited for it. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to patrons of the channel for their additional support, and I hope to see you all again soon.